Okay, we've got our trinity ready, but you need to know a little bit more about why this is a trinity. When we were trying to get a colony set up here, we couldn't get French Catholics to come and live here. Louis XIV was kind of desperate to get people residing in Louisiana. So after several attempts at trying to get French people over here, he finally just opened up his doors to any non-Anglo culture, willing to say the French, go to the Catholic Church, but more importantly, show up with some money. And the only requirement that he had for these people who came over here and pretended to be French Catholic was to talk French Catholic every day. Well, French wasn't the problem. That was a language everybody could understand. Catholic becomes a little bit of a problem when you're not from that religious base. So three in Catholic is Trinity. So we've got three vegetables, onions, celery, bell pepper. So on a day-to-day -day basis in your kitchen, you tell somebody you need a Trinity of four. That means you're going to use two cups of onions, one cup of celery, and one cup of bell pepper. So that way we kept that, con that, that concept of Catholic going on. Our original cultures consisted of Germans. We had a lot of Jewish families that came in here as a totally different religious group. The Native Americans were counted in our initial numbers. And of course, to get a workforce, we bring the African slaves in, all of which we list on our rolls as French and Catholic. Don't forget what you know, just don't do it on Louis' time. So when you worked from the time you get up Monday morning till the, after you went to church on Sunday, then you had free time. Only after you finished going to Mass on Sunday morning did you have free time. And that's when you perpetuated your beliefs, told your stories, and kept all those histories going. Okay, that gets our history behind the Trinity going. Let's talk a little bit about the roux. A roux is a French concept. It's generally butter and flour that you put together and you use for thicketing purposes. Well, here in Louisiana, when you come down to live, and you don't have a lot of ways of changing colors, flavors, and textures of food, because most of what we have here initially is a very water-oriented environment. Lots of water everywhere, not a good growing median for vegetables and spices. You learn how to take and let the flour cook a little bit longer in your oil, and you change the color, and then you change the flavor. At the same time, you're changing the texture of the food. So a very light roux, which would be in a French concept, you'd end up with a thick end product, a very dark roux, which lends itself more into cultures that need ways of changing flavor, like the Cajuns. Darker roux become thinner, but much, much better flavors for them. So today, we're gonna to be making a roux, and we're gonna go through all these different color changes that will allow us to change the flavor of the food. And what I'll do is along the way, pull a little bit of flour out so that you can see how these color changes might affect the dish when it's finished, okay? Equal parts of oil to flour. So we've got a pound of lard cooking in our skillet, or heating up in our skillet here. And to measure a pound, if you don't have a scale, what I generally do is instead of the concept of measuring flours specifically for pastries, where everything has to be exactly the right amount, I always take, measure my flour, shake it off, but I don't level it off. Traditionally, a flour for a pastry would be leveled off flat like this. I don't do that. This little bit of extra flour that I leave on the top actually allows me to come up pretty close to a pound without having to have uh, a scale. Now, I have to have two cups to have a pound, so we're gonna do that twice in our measurement, and this way we have the necessary amount we need to meet the requirements of doing something in equal parts of oil to flour. If you have a scale, certainly go to the trouble of using it because it makes things even better. All right, once you get all this going, you're gonna let your oil get hot. That's what I'm doing right now in the skillet, letting it get hot. I melted it down, I'm gonna let it get hot. Hey guys, remember, be a cleaner as you goer. You don't let anything get built up on the cooktop. You don't get every dish in the kitchen dirty just because you got your hands on it. If you do that, you clean it up. Don't leave it for somebody else. Okay, once you get your oil hot enough, and the way you know if it's hot enough, is you take just little bits of flour and drop it in the oil. You can see this is nowhere near red. Um, light roux were used to make cream-based soups. Darker roux were used to make, slightly darker roux were, were used to make um, Creole sauces, darker roux than that, maybe your etouffee, and then when you get to the darker, darker browns, that's usually where we considered our gumbos to be perfect, okay? 
Dark rooms, remember, are going to be thin end product when we're done here. All these cultures that come together influence our food here. And in the case of the roux, I think most of these dark roux come to us via the Cajun world. These rural country peasants had fled Europe looking for religious freedoms. They found them in Canada. They were living in Canada for 200 years, and nobody bothered them. And then along come the English and expel them. The expulsion of the Acadian was to kill them off. So we never had to deal with French Catholics on this side of the globe ever again. Well, resourceful people like they were, they make it to New Orleans. Only we're not a French Catholic colony. Can you see how this is sizzling now? So I'm ready to dump my flour in, and I'll continue talking about that backwards. All right now, when I teach you to make a roux, I teach you to put all your flour in at one time. I have found that the folks who put a little bit of flour in and stir it in, and then a little bit more in and stir it in, by the time they get all their flour in, that early flour has a chance to have gone on and burned on you, and you get a much heavier flavor in your food. Okay, let me pull a little bit of this out along the way. So you can kind of see where we start, and then I'll have a full plate of the different colors as we go through it here. All right, well, these Acadians, when they get to New Orleans, discover not, we're not French Catholic. They're not real happy with the environment that we have down here. They don't like what's happened with the people. There's been a lot of racial blending, which anywhere else in the world is illegal, but here is not illegal. They had a lot of, um, what's a good word? vices. There was drinking going on here. There was a lot of partying going on here. And they didn't like any of that. They didn't want to be any part of it. So they're going to leave until the Spanish governor of Louisiana tells them, look, if you'll stay, we'll give you most of the southern, western side of southern Louisiana. Well, the first question asked is, are you going to bother us over there? And of course, the response to that is, I don't think so. We won't even be able to find you over so they loved it. They loved that they were going to be left alone. No one was going to come in. No one was going to go out. And so they were going to be perfectly happy living over there. Well, they get over there, and of course, it's swamp water. Whatever swam by your back door at high tides, probably what you ate. Whatever got stuck in the mud at low tides, what you ate. They didn't have a lot of herbs and spices. There wasn't a lot of land for growing anything. But they knew that concept of a French roof. So they'd start their butter up. And everybody knows once your flour goes into your oil, you do not stop stirring it. Now this is something if you're going to do with the kids, you want to make sure you do it together because this gets pretty hot. You want to make sure you have a good handle on either your whisk or your roux spoon, whichever you want to use, and you constantly move it around. I know when someone invites me to their house to cook a gumbo, I turn the heat really, really low. So it takes a long time to make the roux so they can do it carefully. And then once I get it going, they probably wake up from being asleep all night long. And I get them to start stirring while I fix them a cup of coffee. And I never have to go back to stirring that roux again because I've left them with it the whole time. All right, we got a nice little richer brown color here. Totally different from where we began. So we'll pull that spoon out. Don't stop stirring that roux. Well, my guess is Marie, our good Cajun housewife, was making, oh, I don't know, maybe a bechamel sauce, mac and cheese, because you have to use them a roux to make a good homemade mac and cheese. Whatever she was doing, she stopped stirring as soon as she heard her kids in the background fighting. And she didn't want them to kill each other. So they go to the background to solve the problem. And when she gets back up, she discovers her flour has browned. Doesn't know what she's gonna do. Oh mon dieu, papa's gonna be very angry with me. I have to throw this out and start all over again. Well, her friend sitting there tells her to use it that her husband won't taste anything he cooks, anything she cooks, he just kind of scarfs it down. So she thought about it for a long time and she said, you know, I think I don't want an argument over using more money to buy more flour, so I'm gonna go ahead and use that slightly brown flour roux. And then when Papa comes home and tastes it, of course he says, it doesn't taste the same as the last time. And she tells him, but she followed his, his mom's recipe to the tea, and he says, no, look, it's a different color, but it looks good. I'm not objecting to the color. And he tastes it and he goes, it doesn't taste the same, but you know what? I don't mind it either. Tastes pretty good. I think you finally figured out a way that we can make the same dish taste different every single time. So she said, he said, what happened? She said, well, I was making the butter flour roux. The kids got into a fuss and went back to stop them so they wouldn't kill each other. And by the time I got back and the, the flour had browned. So I went ahead and used it. 
And then he says, well, let's make it darker next time. And the next thing you know, they're changing the colors, the flavors, the food, just by how long they fried their flour in that butter. And then after a while, he, Marie says, hey, you know, Pierre, we have other, other oils we can use. And he said, well, let's try them. So that's when they tried the lard. So that's what I'm using for my oil here. Not a lot of people use lard anymore because they think it's bad for us. Not the best oil in the market, but nowhere near as bad as they thought. During the World War II, when they discovered they had all these vegetables, to, they couldn't sell to anybody, paid farmers to grow and all that. They had to figure out a way of getting rid of them. So they extracted the oil using a chemical process, created Crisco and margarine, and then went around the world telling the people, don't eat butter, eat margarine, don't, leave, don't use lard, use Crisco. And margarine and Crisco have a lot of trans fats in them. So you gotta be really, really careful with what you're doing there. You don't wanna put those trans fats in your body if you can help it. So it'll take us some time to get back to getting lard back into our diets. Great pie crust, best biscuit you'll ever have. If you wanna do some deep fat frying, use the lard, because for some reason it doesn't get absorbed by the food you're frying in, okay? We're gonna come back and we're gonna a few more spoons of this out so you can actually see where all this ends up. And then we're gonna need that roux, that, I mean, that mirepoix that I have hanging over here, that trinity. We're gonna need that trinity to go ahead and get ready to stop this roux from cooking. I'm not gonna push it too much longer. I did this one on high heat, guys, because I don't have a lot of time to be with you. So I've gotta get it done quickly. So I have to get it done very, very fast. You wanna do it on low heat. Take your time, really, really push it and push it and push it till it's really super, super dark and you'll really get some good flavor out of it. Now you see the flowers absorb most of my lard here. And so I've got a pretty good roux. You don't wanna push it too long. If you keep doing this, the flour will break down and it won't hold on to that oil. Once you get it to the color you want, then those trin that mirepoix, that trinity, goes down into the cooking. And you hear the sizzling? Call for Dom's mom, call that Cajun napalm. Forgot the spoon, guys, don't go away, I'm coming back. And now you wanna move this off the heat so that it doesn't brown anymore and burn on the bottom and just mix it all together. And this, these vegetables will stop this roux from cooking, stabilize it, keep it from burning. At the same time, the heat of the roux is going to start cooking down our onions, our celery, our bell pepper, our trinity, and we'll be set to begin making our gumbo. If we didn't do it quite as dark, we could do maybe a creole or an etouffee. It just depends. The basis for all of our cooking is first you make that roux. Get it the color you want, you establish your flavors with this, and then you can build it from here. You come to visit me here at the school, when I do my gumbo, I'm not gonna put any spices at all in it. And I hope you'll try it that way at home so that you'll learn that the brew could give a great flavor to your food even if you had nothing else to work with.